Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Here I will guide you explore ECU repair techniques and automotive electronics. We will go step by step how to operate, how to troubleshoot, and how to work directly with the car. For beginners who may not yet have knowledge of electronics or components, I have created a video series explaining basic electronic components. The goal is to help you build a strong foundation so you can gradually enter deeper into the field of automotive ECU repair. In the previous lessons, we already studied resistors, capacitor capacitors, coils, and transformers. And today, we move on to one of the most important topics, semiconductors and diodes. This is the material that created a turning point in the entire history of modern electronics. So, what exactly is a semiconductor, and why is it considered the heart of digital technology? Let's go step by step to understand it. 1. What is a semiconductor? A semiconductor is a type of material whose conductivity lies between a conductor, like copper or aluminum, and an insulator, like glass or plastic. The special point is, its conductivity can be changed. It can change depending on temperature, light, electric field, or by adding impurities, which we call doping. Common semiconductors are silicon Si, germanium, GE, and gallium arsenide, GAAS. For example, at normal temperature, silicon almost behaves like an insulator. But when you increase the temperature or shine light on it, electrons inside silicon are released, and suddenly the material becomes conductive. Thanks to this property, we can build essential devices such as diodes, transistors, integrated circuits, and sensors. 2. Why is semiconductor called the era of technology? Semiconductors created a new era of technology for several reasons. Foundation of microchips and processors. All computers, smartphones, televisions, and modern cars use processors and memory made from semiconductors. Miniaturization, more power, smaller size. Before semiconductors, people had to use vacuum tubes. A single computer could be as big as a building. With semiconductor technology, billions of transistors can fit onto a tiny chip smaller than your fingertip. Devices became more powerful, more compact, and more energy efficient. Extremely wide applications, smartphones, the internet, satellites, electric vehicles, artificial intelligence, IoT, medical equipment, robots, all of them rely on semiconductor technology. Economic and social impact, whoever controls semiconductor technology controls advanced technology. That is why it is called the backbone of the digital era. Conclusion. A semiconductor is not just a material, it is truly the heart of modern technology opening the door to the digital age, artificial intelligence, and smart technologies. And in the next part, we will go deeper into the structure, working principle, and practical applications of the semiconductor diode, one of the most fundamental components in every electronic circuit. Now, let's take a deeper look so we can clearly understand this material, the semiconductor. A semiconductor is the basic material used to create many important electronic devices. For example, diodes, transistors, and integrated circuits. These are the parts we can see in almost every electronic device today. So, what makes a semiconductor special? It is because a semiconductor is in between a conductor and an insulator. From a chemical point of view, the atoms of a semiconductor have four electrons in their outermost shell. The two most common semiconductors are germanium, also called GE, and silicon, also called SI. From these pure semiconductors, engineers create two different types, N-type semiconductor, P-type semiconductor. When we combine an N-type material with a P-type material, we can make a diode or a transistor. These are the building blocks of all modern electronics. Both silicon and germanium have a valence of four. This means each atom has four electrons in the outer shell. In their pure crystal form, the atoms of silicon or germanium connect together through covalent bonds. They form a strong and stable crystal structure, which you can see in the diagram here. N-type semiconductor. When we add a very small amount of an element with valence 5, for example, phosphorus into a crystal of silicon, something special happens. Each atom of silicon has four electrons in its outer shell, but an atom of phosphorus has five electrons in its outer shell. When a phosphorus atom takes the place of a silicon atom in the crystal, it will share four electrons and make covalent bonds with the four neighboring silicon atoms. But there is still one extra electron left over. This fifth electron does not take part in bonding. 
it becomes a free electron. Because there are many free electrons, this material conducts electricity mainly by electrons, which carry negative charge. That is why it is called an n-type semiconductor, n for negative. In short, n-type semiconductor is created when we dope silicon with a group 5 element, such as phosphorus. The extra electrons make it conduct electricity using electrons. P-type semiconductor. Now the opposite happens with P-type. If we add a small amount of an element with valence 3, for example, indium, into a silicon crystal, we get a different result. Indium has only three electrons in its outer shell, while silicon has four. When indium replaces a silicon atom in the crystal, it can only make three covalent bonds with neighboring silicon atoms. The fourth bond is incomplete. It is missing one electron. This missing electron creates what we call a hole. These holes can move inside the crystal structure. They behave like particles carrying positive charge. So this material conducts electricity using holes and of which act like positive carriers. That is why it is called a P-type semiconductor. P for positive. In short, P-type semiconductor is created when we dope silicon with a group 3 element, such as indium. It produces holes, and these holes conduct electricity as positive charge carriers. P-N junction and structure of a diode. When we join together two types of semiconductor, one P-type and one type, at the point where they touch, a P-N junction is formed. Now, what happens in this junction? From the N-type region, the extra electrons begin to move across into the P-type region, where they fill the empty holes. As this process happens, a layer of charged ions is created right at the junction. These ions carry opposite charges, but overall, the region stays electrically neutral. This layer of ions forms a very thin insulating barrier. It prevents current from flowing directly between the P-side and the N-side. And this is what we call the P-N junction. It is also the basic principle behind the construction of a diode. In the diagram above, you can see both the symbol and the physical appearance of some common types of diodes. forward bias of a diode, when we apply a positive voltage to the anode, which is the p-type region, and a negative voltage to the cathode, which is the n-type region, something important happens. Under the effect of this external voltage, the insulating barrier at the p-n junction becomes narrower. When the voltage difference between the two terminals reaches about 0.6 volts for a silicon diode, or about 0.2 volts for a germanium diode, the insulating region completely disappears. At that moment, the diode starts to conduct current. If we continue to increase the supply voltage, the current through the diode rises very quickly. However, the voltage across the diode does not rise. It remains almost constant at about 0.6 volts for a silicon diode. Conclusion. When a silicon diode is forward biased, the forward voltage drop stays nearly fixed at 0.6 volts. If the forward voltage is less than 0.6 volts, no current flows through the diode. Once the forward voltage reaches about 0.6 volts, current begins to flow. After that, as the current increases, the forward voltage drop stays nearly fixed at 0.6 volts. Reverse bias of a diode. When a diode is reverse biased, the positive terminal of the power supply is connected to the cathode, which is the n-type region, and the negative terminal is connected to the anode, which is the p-type region. Under the effect of this reverse voltage, the depletion region at the p-n junction becomes wider and wider. This wide depletion region prevents current from flowing through the junction. In fact, a diode can withstand a very large reverse voltage. Only when the reverse voltage reaches a very high level about 1,000 volts, the diode will break down. Now I will show you how to check a diode using a traditional analog multimeter. First, set the meter to the times 1 ohm range. Place the two probes across the two terminals of the diode. If you measure in the forward direction, the black probe is on the anode, the red probe is on the cathode, and the needle moves up. Then, when you reverse the probes, the needle does not move. This means the diode is good. If, in both directions, the needle goes all the way up to zero ohm, then the diode is shorted. 
if in the forward direction the needle does not move at all, then the diode is open or broken. Finally, if you switch the range to 1 kilo ohm and in the reverse direction the needle still moves up a little bit, that means the diode is leaky. Applications of semiconductor diodes. Because a diode conducts current only in one direction, it is widely used in many electronic circuits. First, in rectifier circuits, a diode converts alternating current, or AC, into direct current, or DC. Second, in detector circuits, a diode can separate the signal from a radio wave. Third, in clamping or biasing circuits, a diode helps set the proper operating point for a transistor. In ECUs, diodes are also integrated for reverse polarity protection. This means if the positive and negative wires are connected incorrectly, the diode will protect the ECU from damage. And finally, in power rectification, several diodes can be combined together into a bridge rectifier. Uh, this compact package allows the diode to handle higher current and convert AC to DC more efficiently. Zener diode. The Zener diode has a structure very similar to a normal diode. It is made of two semiconductor layers, type P and type N, joined together. In forward bias, the Zener diode behaves just like a regular diode, but in reverse bias, something special happens. The Zener diode will clamp the voltage at a fixed level. That level is exactly the value written on the diode itself. For example, in the circuit shown, Manesh U1 is a power source that can vary in voltage. Deed DZ is the Zener diode used here as a voltage regulator. R1 is a resistor that limits the current. When the source voltage U1 is greater than the Zener voltage VZ, the voltage across the Zener diode always stays constant, no matter how much U1 changes. However, as U1 increases, the reverse current flowing through the Zener also increases. This reverse current is normally limited to about 30 milliamps. In practice, engineers often choose U1 to be about 1.5 to 2 times the Zener voltage and select the resistor R1 so that the maximum reverse current through the diode stays below 30 milliamps. If U1 is less than the Zener voltage, then the Zener diode does not regulate, and its voltage will change as U1 changes. But if, if U1 is greater than the Zener voltage, the Zener diode clamps the voltage, and the output stays fixed at the Zener value. Photodiode. The photodiode operates in reverse bias mode. Its case is designed with a small glass window. This window allows light to reach the PN junction. When light shines onto the junction, a reverse current flows through the diode. This reverse current is directly proportional to the intensity of the light. In simple words, the stronger the light, the more the photodiode conducts. In the example circuit shown, when a flashlight shines on the photodiode, the lamp connected in the circuit will light up, and the brightness of the lamp depends on the intensity of the light shining onto the photodiode. Um, if the flashlight is very bright, the lamp shines strongly. If the flashlight is weak, the lamp shines only dimly. Light emitting diode LED. The light emitting diode, or LED, is a diode that emits light when it is in forward bias. The working voltage of an LED is about 1.7 volts to 2.2 volts. The current flowing through the LED is usually between 5 milliamps and 20 milliamps. LEDs are widely used as power indicators, flashing decorative lights, status indicators showing whether a circuit has power. And today, in modern automobiles, almost all vehicle lighting systems use LEDs because they are efficient, durable, and produce bright light. Varicap diode, variable capacitance diode. The Varicap diode, also called the variable capacitance diode, is a type of diode that has a capacitance similar to a capacitor. This capacitance changes when we vary the reverse voltage applied to the diode. Application of Varicap diodes. They are commonly used in resonant circuits. For example, as shown in the circuit above, when we adjust the variable resistor VR, the reverse voltage applied to the Varicap diode changes. This causes the capacitance of the diode to change, and as a result, the resonant frequency of the circuit also changes. Varicap diodes are widely used in television channel tuners and in circuits where the resonant frequency needs to be controlled by voltage. 
fast recovery diode switching diode. In switching power supplies at the output of the high frequency transformer, we must use a fast recovery diode, also called a switching diode, for the rectification process. This type of diode is designed to operate at high frequencies, around several tens of kilohertz. A normal rectifier diode cannot replace a switching diode in this position. However, a switching diode can replace a normal diode in most circuits. Because of this special feature, the price of a switching diode is much higher than that of a regular diode. In terms of appearance and shape, there is almost no difference between a switching diode and a regular diode. But switching diodes are usually marked with a dashed ring, or sometimes with two rings on their body. Detector diode and rectifier diode detector diode. This is a small diode, usually covered with a glass case. It is also called a point contact diode because the contact between the P-type and N-type semiconductors is made at a very small point. This design helps to reduce parasitic capacitance. Detector diodes are mainly used in high-frequency circuits to extract or detect the signal from a modulated wave. Rectifier diode. A rectifier diode is used to convert alternating current AC into direct current DC. It is commonly used in power supply circuits with a frequency of 50 Hz. These rectifier diodes are usually classified by current rating, for example, 1 ampere, 2 amperes, or 5 amperes. So, in this lesson, I have helped you understand semiconductors and diodes. The reason why I put them together is because the diode is the most basic and original component that comes directly from semiconductor material. This makes it easier for you to imagine and understand. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe so you won't miss the upcoming lessons.